workers increase their standard of living and increase their wages through the class struggle, but there's limits to, to what that can bear if the economy in which that class struggle is happening isn't growing and isn't producing surplus. Welcome to the Political Economy Project with the goal of creating universal prosperity for today and future generations. My name is Evan Papp and I'm the executive producer of Empathy Media Lab that publishes content on labor, political economy, art and culture, and we're a proud member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. Today I'm speaking with Christian Parenti, who is a professor of economics at John Jay College, teaching both the undergraduate and master's program. And he's also an investigative journalist and an author of numerous books. We'll be discussing his book, Radical Hamilton, Economic Lessons from a Misunderstood Founder. Christian, thanks so much for your time. Thank you for having me on the show. So what got you interested in Hamilton? Well, it was sort of a, by mistake. I, I read the Ron Chernow biography many years ago, which I think also Lin-Manuel Miranda read and led him to write the musical. I've not seen the musical. This was not inspired by the musical. But in that Chernow biography there was mention of, of Hamilton's interest in industrial planning and in industrialization and in creating a really robust role for government in the industrial transformation of the United States. And there just wasn't that much about it. In particular, there was a you know, passing mention of the report on the subject of manufacturers, which is always name checked as Hamilton's magnum opus. This is like the, the most important thing he ever wrote. But really, all of the literature on Hamilton focuses on his writing about finance and what he did to build the country's credit system. So I just wanted to find out more about this report on the subject of manufacturers and looked through the literature and found out that indeed there really wasn't that much written about it, even as it was name checked as if it was something everybody already knew about. And so... The idea came up with Verso to actually republish the report on manufacturers and I would write an introduction. And anyway, the introduction turned into this book. So the report on manufacturers is not in the book, but it is discussed a lot. I mean, it's, it's really a centerpiece of the book, but we didn't have room in the end to republish that, that document, but that document is free online and people can read it. I mean, it's hard to read because it's written in like, you know, 18th century English. Yeah. You also mentioned that Chernow was completely wrong on Hamilton's support of Adam Smith. And in some ways, Hamilton's going against this whole idea of lazy, fair, free market. And at the same time, who is Adam Smith writing for? He's, mm -hmm. he's writing for the British East India Company under Lord Shelburne, who is attacking the United States after they signed the Declaration of Independence with their former colonies. And then they were using ideology to destroy the colonies or the, the new country afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The report on manufacturers opens with an attack on Smith in the style of the, the framers. Smith is not actually named. There's a weird uh, style of writing, which I, from what I have read, we don't really understand why they did this. But anyway, the framers were in the habit of quoting without naming a lot of their sources. So the report on manufacturers opens with a very clear critique of Adam Smith, and it even includes some quotes from Smith. And what Hamilton says is, you know, well, free trade is, is great if you're the dominant power. If you've got a head start in manufacturing, then sure, you want free trade. You want access to the markets of other countries that have weak, underdeveloped infant industries, or what that's what Frederick List, the great developmentalist economist, would call it infant industries. List was lived in America for a while and was very much influenced by the Hamiltonian school of political economy. Hamilton referred to it as infant manufacturers. They didn't actually use, he didn't use the word industrialization. It was manufacturing and manufacturers. But so if your country like the post-revolutionary United States had only infant manufacturers that could be overwhelmed by the cheaper, better built products of a more developed economy, you know, then free trade didn't look very good. So that's, you know, that's the opening passages of the report on manufacturers is to sort of just swat away all of this free market nonsense and say, look, if you want, and, and, and for Hamilton, the whole project of industrialization is couched in politics and military concerns and administrative concerns. So, and, and this is in part because the 
critical period, the period right after the Revolutionary War, was marked by growing political fragmentation and violence and a very serious economic downturn. Yeah. And Hamilton was aware that to transform the economic situation and, and, and transform the political crisis, there, there had to be a program of what we would call industrialization. So his, his concern was military, right? Ultimately saying, if, yeah. if, you, if we want to defend this country, this country has to be rich. For it to be rich so as to afford a Navy and a military and a state that has the capacity to manage all this, the economy has to move from a fragmented patchwork of these little regional post-colonial economies that are dependent primarily on agriculture and trade, export of raw materials, into an economy that is primarily driven by manufacturing and what we would call industrialization. And he's very clear, says this is not going to happen with sufficient speed if we just leave it to the market. This has to be planned and government has to push this forward. And that's what the report on manufacturers is all about. And, and that's also why it's not discussed, right? That's the obvious hidden in plain sight thing. It's like it, it, that to, to understand that, that the, the development of American capitalism is the product not of a bunch of independent competitive entrepreneurs, though there were those characters and that, that's an important force in it, but that, that a huge part of what drove industrialization was a massive program of government planning. And, and what Hamilton lays out in the report on manufacturers is in many ways the blueprint for all the, the following great industrial projects, Germany, Japan, on and on. Yeah, and we see it in China working magnificently today. Yes. And yeah. it, it, it comes through the name of dirigism, which is a French word to, I believe, almost have like indicative planning within within a central government. Mm -hmm. And you do an incredible job of going through the Revolutionary War. It's very easy for us in our air-conditioned summer homes to kind of critique what was going on in the Revolutionary War and, and what Hamilton's role was in the Revolutionary War. Could you talk a little bit about what, what Hamilton's role was with Washington and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and everything he was doing and then even yeah. his, his fever that, that he, he almost died from during this, yeah. this period? Yeah. So Hamilton starts out, you know, he's an immigrant. He, he, goes, to, he goes to what's now Columbia College. And while in college, the Revolutionary War is beginning and he forms a militia company. And in the beginning of the war, he is commanding this artillery unit in this militia company. But within a little over the first year, after, after the first year, he is recruited by Washington to be part of Washington's general staff. And Hamilton is getting all these invitations from other generals, and he's kind of holding out until he gets this offer he you know, really can't turn down if he wants to advance in life to be part of Washington's family, as it was called, his general staff. And so he leaves the front lines and he enters the, the planning apparatus of the Continental Army. And from that vantage point, he sees how totally dysfunctional the political structure of the country is and how important economic capacity is to military capacity and to military victory. So these are two themes, right? The uh, political fragmentation and economic capacity that will be the center of his life's work after the war. So I described the, the supply effort and how the Continental Army tried to supply itself. So first of all, you know, all these colonies, the, there's the, the Articles of Confederation, the constitution that we have that's ratified in 1789, passed in 1787, that is, you know, barely a twinkle in anyone's eye. And the colonies are held together by a very loose defense pact called the, the Articles of Confederation. And the only, what we would say federal, but then was national institution is Congress and the Continental Army. And the, the states or colonies, rebel, rebel colonies, states have tremendous autonomy. And when they, so the Continental Army doesn't have the power to demand resources from these states. It's, it's continually asking for resources. And sometimes they are forthcoming and sometimes they are not. And Frequently, when they're forthcoming, they come with very localistic stipulations, so like 
uh, one example that comes to mind is Pennsylvania offering some supplies to the Continental Army, but saying they should only go to men of the Pennsylvania line. So they had, there were also state militias fielded by the states, but then within the Continental Army, there, there were units, even though they were under a single command, there were local units. So there's like the Pennsylvania line, the New Jersey line, the New York line. So very dysfunctional. And a lot of how the effort is at first funded is just through printing money. And they go through a series of currencies and quasi-currencies, and there's hyperinflation. And then they just resort to, I mean, along the way, as these currencies are losing value, the continental dollar and Pierce's notes being the most famous, they are increasingly moving towards requisition, the continental army that is, where they show up and you know offer soon to be worthless money in exchange for the supplies they want. And the farmers and artisans and small merchants who are being asked to provide this stuff really don't have a choice. They have to take this price or if they refuse to cooperate, then they're considered enemy, enemies of the revolution and the goods can just be confiscated. So there's a real economic catastrophe developing within the war. But at the same time, the industrial capacity of the country is growing because you have this huge demand of these three armies, eventually, once the French get involved, these three huge armies consuming enormous amounts of fodder for animals, salt, you know, weaponry, clothing. I mean, the amounts of papers and candles, just enormous amounts of material. We, we often have this idea of the kind of Bunker Hill, Minutemen, guerrilla style warfare. That was an element in the American Revolution, but it was also conventional 18th century warfare with long supply chains and very complicated and for those days, high tech and expensive hardware at work. So implicit in part of what Hamilton is doing while on Washington's staff, i.e. part of his family, is already managing and planning and trying to build up the industrial capacity. It's during the war that the Springfield Armory, it's not quite, it doesn't become a federal armory yet because it's, there is no federal government, but they're already, the Continental Army is already subsidizing and, and essentially planning with the, the Armory in Springfield, Massachusetts to create weapons. The Armory in Springfield, Massachusetts, a student of mine, a master's student, wrote a very interesting thesis on this about the, the central importance of the Springfield Armory in creating interchangeable parts and really being in the vanguard of a lot of industrial processes that we, in many cases, associate with, you know, Fordism when it comes a hundred or more years later. So, so that's what his experience is like with Washington. And he has this nervous breakdown, which is interesting because his writings before and after are very different. So in the run up to, so this is going into the winter of seven, 77 to 78. He is, uh, they're headed to Valley Forge, they're being driven out of New York and they're basically fighting this rear guard action, retreating, fighting, retreating. And they, they winter at Valley Forge. And Britain's and, in Philadelphia at that time, occupying Philadelphia. So the Britain's like pretty much gonna win this right now. Yeah. They've driven, they've, they've got New York, they've got Philadelphia. Yeah, it's, it's looking bad. They've driven Congress out of Philadelphia like a, a coven of partridges, as John Adams puts it. And there's, things are going bad, but there's one victory, which is that General Burgoyne, the British General Burgoyne has invaded from Canada and he is stopped and defeated at Saratoga by General Gates and, and serving with and under General Gates is, General Putnam. And at this point, the whole command structure begins to disintegrate. So Gates captures this enormous arsenal and he's unwilling to give troops and some of this arsenal to Washington, who's further south in Valley Forge. And Gates is beginning to have an independent relationship with the, the, the war board, which is essentially the kind of civilian military board above the Continental Army. And so even though Gates is a subordinate of Washington's, he's also on this board and he's using this position to assert his autonomy and he's developing plans totally independently to invade New York. And the whole thing is beginning to spin out of control. Now, part of this is probably also Washington's ego and wanting to keep control of it. But strategically speaking, you're not going to win a war if you have 
a fragmented command structure, if you've got rogue generals going off on their own. So Washington sends Hamilton up the Hudson Valley, just Hamilton and another guy to go intercept Gates, General Gates and General Putnam to stop them from invading New York and to send troops and weapons to Valley Forge, which is where the command is, but it's also blocking. Congress is behind them. And so between the Brits in Philadelphia and Congress is the Continental Army at Valley Forge. And Hamilton manages to do this, but then he collapses into a nervous fever and he's out of commission for about two months, staying at the house of a, a Patriot supporter named Kennedy. And it's really clear that his writings before that weird fever in which he's ranting and hallucinating his writings before that are, are kind of just like revolutionary boilerplate. It's a, you know, very similar to Jefferson, just like democracy and freedom and this and that. And then after this weird breakdown, he starts writing these long, very detailed, very intense letters to, to elites to try and put into their minds the idea of one, a constitutional convention, a sort of refounding of a stronger central state and of this whole economic project of, of planning and economic transition. There really does seem to be this before and after. And, uh, you know, what, what was that? Was it some sort of nervous breakdown, some sort of combination of stress and physical illness? Who knows? But whatever the case, after this, this fever, he comes out with this like weird kind of crystal, maniacally, crystal clear, maniacal vision. He just like hammers away at it and kind of builds, builds support for the vision. And he's he's in his early 20s and he's going up to try to ask Gates, who just won these on, like won the only victories after like loss after loss with Washington and people. I'm, I'm sure the other generals are like, well, Washington sucks compared to yeah. Gates. We should be following Gates. And he's 20. He's like early 20s and he goes up there and he convinces Gates to move some of the material and troops to help with supporting some of the the Washington's commands essentially. And yeah, it's, it's just incredible. Uh, this, this, this guy, Hamilton, he's a, he's a, it's a crazy, crazy life story. Yeah. And one of the letters that he writes that I, I learned about from, from this book as well, it, it, I think he's writing to either Morris, uh, governor Morris, or mm -hmm. one of the other like leaders to try to seed these ideas, but the idea of speculation and how speculators, you want to try to harness their criminal energy into the government because they're going to attack you if they're outside of it. But if you can have them inside and give the and and almost like appeal to their their greed <laughs> yeah. to to try to to get the speculators within the financial structure, that's almost better. And that that was like a kind of a profound concept that I, Yeah. I, it's not I mean his vision is not, you know, super egalitarian and one of social justice. It is one of progress and a sort of rising tide lifting all boats. Yes. And his so he recognizes the danger of speculators who are parasitically feeding off the project of the revolution. And, and he realizes pragmatically that it's, you know, you can't just sort of hand things over to them because they'll run it into the ground. But if you totally exclude them, then they'll be outside attacking. And so as you described, his idea was to sort of you know, keep your enemies close and, and, you know, in the end, try and get the, the, the speculator, financier, rentier class to have faith in and depend on the Bank of the United States, the first central bank. And so after the war, the finances are a total disaster. Hamilton is at the end of the war, really. Hamilton takes out a large, well, the, the U.S. takes out a large foreign loan and the and this is I mean now we've sort of jumped beyond the the critical phase of the eighteen of the of the of the eighties the seventeen eighties in which Shays Rebellion and all sort of stuff happens but I mean ultimately what will happen is that a central bank is created that offers really good interest rates for speculators who lend money to the federal government and for that whole arrangement to work there also has to be a robust taxation project. And so Hamilton creates a fleet of Coast Guard cutters to collect revenue and a whole series of tariffs 
to at the ports to, on imports and exports and all this is about i mean th these are these become tools for you know knobs on the sort of planning dial to you know try and get the industrial outcomes that are wanted but this is also a way of generating revenue to then pay off these lenders and the u.s funded debt is offering six percent when in europe most of the Debt. I forget. Actually, it's, it's been a while since I've looked at my own book. There, I think it's it it four four yeah. percent, and in Europe I, they're mostly offering three, or it was four in Europe, and then U.S. offers six. Something. Yeah, like I that. think it was six percent that that you wrote about. And at the same time, the idea of the central government is going to assume all the debts of the states. And uh, as a side note, you did mention the Shays Rebellion, mm -hmm. which I I mean it looks very justified. You know, looking oh, back on it, yeah. where you have all these soldiers were promised in this paper money that they were fighting for many years and they weren't getting anything and they finished the war and they have these these paper you know credits essentially and there there are speculators that come in and say we'll give you actual species and gold at at very depressed rates and then hamilton and and the, the central government says we're going to buy all that original debt yeah. at full value Right. And and make everyone whole again. And a lot of these people like Shays who were in the Revolutionary War were like, this is insane. We're <laughs> they're they're getting thrown in debtors prison, you know. Right. And there's also what's going on is that the states are trying to pay down their debts. And they're doing that by squeezing every last drop of resources they can out of the producing classes. And so in Massachusetts, the state debt has been consolidated in the hands of like, you know, I think I forget the percentage, but it's more than half of it is owned by like 35 guys on the coast. And they are demanding more and more from these desperate farmers in Western Mass. There's also, um, and this is, so what happens is, you know, during the war, the, they're printing continental dollars, and then they're also issuing these IOUs after that. And soldiers and other, you know, merchants and teamsters supporting the effort are, are receiving, getting paid and stuff, and they're immediately selling it at a massive discount. And so... These speculators go up and they buy all this debt up at a fraction of the face value. And so this assumption of state debts is very unfair, but it's also hard to imagine how it, it could have been done otherwise. So what Hamilton does is he offers to buy all of this debt at face value. That's unfair because it's not being held by the poor soldiers and farmers who were originally paid this debt, but it's being held by these wealthy these speculators and they're going to make a killing on it. But in exchange for paying off these, these debts and all the state debts, the, the states have to relinquish their Western land claims. And a lot of states had no Western border. It was just like, as far as it goes out West, that's where Virginia ends, right? And so Hamilton manages to, he, he initiates the process that leads to every single state ultimately relinquishing their land claims to the federal government, which becomes very useful going forward in the 19th century for the continuation of this sort of Hamiltonian style diergiste political economy. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's an incredible resource against which the federal government can borrow. And it's a resource that the federal government can deploy to produce things, like canals and railroads. So, but what's happening in, uh, what's also happening during the, the critical period is that there's a massive volcano in Iceland, and there's also one in Japan. And this leads to a cooling over parts of the Northern Hemisphere. This is now recognized, the effects of this are now recognized to be pretty important to kicking off the French Revolution as well. But something like 15,000 people died in Iceland from this year long eruption of Lakia, I think is how you pronounce it, this volcano. And in the Northeast, it, there are two years of really bad weather, very cold, wet summers. So Shays Rebellion kicks off after two years of almost failed harvests while these, uh, this is before the assumption of the state debts and all that stuff has happened. And so what's going on at this point is the states are trying to pay off their debts. And that is to say, you know, extract money from their populations to give to these speculators. And it's in response to this that in Massachusetts, the farmers arm many of them Revolutionary War vets, and they just go and they shut down the courts because there's evictions. And they say, you know, there are not going to be any more evictions, and all the lawyers and judges have to get out of here. The militia 
the state militia is mustered and called to attack these rebels and generally the militia dissolves, goes away, or even switches sides. And so the elites in the coast in Boston ultimately have to create a private army of their own to go after the the Shays rebels who don't call themselves Shaysites. They call themselves regulators. And Shays was their one of their main leaders. And and they they get their the rebels are moving on the Springfield Armory in February of 87 at this point. And in the midst of a snowstorm, this private army attacks them and, and they lose. And, and there's actually kind of mop-up operations. A lot of the Shays rebels fall back into Vermont, which at that point is not a, a state. It's not yet part of the, of the U.S. project. It's a, a disputed territory between New Hampshire and New York. And a lot of settlers have gone up from Connecticut, that's where Ethan Allen comes from, and they're resisting the big absentee landlords in New York. In the, it, and this is, turns violent, this conflict over who owns the land that is now Vermont. Even before the Revolutionary War, it's kind of put on hold. But so, And, during and the, it's close to Montreal, which is French. It's close to Halifax, which is Britain, and yep. Britain's obviously an enemy at that time. It's got an international border, which yeah. is dangerous. Yeah. So... Some of the rebels are they're hiding out in Vermont, and Governor Chittenden and Ethan Allen are saying, "Oh well, we you know we disapprove of this," but in reality, they're they're providing support for these rebels. And the mop up operations overlap with the beginning of the Constitutional Convention, and so Shays' Rebellion is just the culmination of you know a decade of of this kind of stuff. There's low intensity conflict against maroon groups in. The, in South Carolina and Georgia, there's intersettler conflict in what's now Eastern Tennessee. There's intersettler conflict pitting rival groups of speculators and their rival bands of settlers against each other in the Wyoming Valley of Pennsylvania. And we're talking about, you know, murder and shootouts, like actual low intensity conflict. There's um, really intense conflict with Native Americans, primarily in Kentucky. And in growing trade wars between states, the, you know, so the whole the whole thing is sort of spinning out of control. New York is imposing these incredibly punitive tariffs on merchants from Connecticut and New Jersey. The whole thing is falling apart, and then the you know the culmination is Shays Rebellion, and that's where everyone's like, "Whoa, we like something has to be done because this isn't working." And so you know, thus. The last bits of action in May of 1780 happened as the delegates arrive in Pennsylvania, in, in Philadelphia, to found, to write the Constitution that we have. And the Constitution is contrary to what a lot of people think. The, 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 the Constitution gives power to the central government. It doesn't take it away from it. In fact, it can't be ratified until the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments are added onto it, protecting individual liberties. And that's very, very important. I mean, that's, I mean, I, I portray Madison and Jefferson as the slave owners that they were, and they were concerned with liberty, but in large part, they were concerned about their autonomy. And they were worried that slavery was under attack already and that numerous Northern states were on the path to abolishing slavery it, it had been written into the Constitution. I mean, Vermont's Constitution made slavery illegal. Massachusetts very early on was like launching itself towards abolition. And the Virginia elite in particular, but also the other Southern elites, were rationally paranoid that if the Northern, Northern states with a more dynamic economy, with higher value added manufacturing, if they gained momentum that this deal, this this new national compact might leave them, the South, outgunned, as it were, and unable to protect slavery. And so there's that very um, unflattering, awful reason for the slave power to push for and defend liberty. But there was also a very progressive and legitimate concern from rank and file people. We're just like, wait a minute, you know, we just fought this war against Britain. And, you know, there's no protection for our rights to speak, to assemble. There's no protection that we won't have troops billeted in our houses, which is such a weird thing now, like troop billeting. But it's like, I mean, that's what 
that's one of the ways that military powers preyed on people. Be like, you, yeah, you got to open your house to these militaries that are going to stay in your community for who knows how long you have to feed them. So the, uh, the Bill of Rights is, is a very, very important and progressive aspect of the Constitution. And Hamilton, I mean, though I'm right, you know, writing this flattering book about him, I mean, he was not all good in this regard. I mean, he definitely did tip into a kind of authoritarian sensibility towards the end. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not here to say that everything he did was good. And it's that tension between the Jeffersonian element and the Hamiltonian element produces a rather remarkable in the constitution. So, so the constitution too, the general welfare is in the preamble. And then it's mentioned again, forget which section. And it's this concept of the general welfare, the South and the slaveholding interests also didn't like it because it, it allows this wide berth of interpretation, obviously, mm -hmm. and what it means. And we could go into the public credit and the public banking and, and the importance of that. But getting right into the report on manufacturers, you wrote that the IMF, if they saw what Hamilton was doing today, they would say, hell no, you can't do it. Right. Get your government right. out there, out of the way. Let these neoliberal deregulated right. privatization policies take place. Could you talk about the, the harmony of agriculture and manufacturing? Yeah. And please, yeah. That, that comment yeah. as well. Yeah, that's actually, to give credit where credit is due, that, that's from a footnote in a Hundred Chang paper mm -hmm. and where he says that if, Ham if Alexander Hamilton were finance minister in some developing economy in the global south today, he would be getting attacked by the IMF and the press in the core economies as some sort of like reckless lunatic who like, did, you know, was, wasn't following the advice of grownups because he was a developmentalist. He wanted to, you know, have economic autonomy. And so, yeah, the general welfare clause is pretty capacious. And when, so Jefferson is away during the Constitutional Convention. He's in Paris. And when he gets back, he's horrified. He's like, this could mean anything. And it's like, that's precisely right. It's like, this is, this was the loophole through which they were going to drive large scale economic planning and even public ownership. And the, the, the general welfare clause, so this empowers Congress to, you know, do whatever needs to be done to support the general welfare, whatever the general welfare is. Right. And that, that language was settled on after more specific language was rejected. So when Franklin wanted to have a clause in the constitution that allowed the federal government to build canals and other transportation arteries and roads, and that was defeated. And so what they got was the general welfare clause, but they also managed to get in the postal clause, the word roads. So it's like the post office, the federal government is going to create a post office and maintain roads. And well, lo and behold, the post office throughout the first half of the 19th century was essentially a massive public works program, massive for the time. But I mean, the kinds of things that the federal government did were like clearing rivers due to the postal clause. They would declare these rivers post roads that the, the federal government builds the vast majority of roads. Most federal employees are working for the post office and they build roads through contractors, but it's the federal government behind it. And so they're building the road network. A lot of the rivers in this country, we think of them as sort of passive geographic features, but they're not. I mean, they were much windier than they are now. I mean, it's also an environmental disaster. It's not, I'm not just absentmindedly overlooking that, but you know, from the point of view of these 18th, 19th century protagonists, this was real progress. You got these winding rivers that are creating cuts through them, but, and they're also like clogged with trees, a lot of them. The Red River, which goes out of Louisiana up into Arkansas, you know, this is all after Hamilton has, has died. We're talking like 1820s and 30s now, 1830s, primarily what is happening. The Red River had a, a log jam that was 150 miles long at times, just called the Wrath. And it was unnavigable. And it was the federal government that went in there. It wasn't for-profit project. It was like, you know, the public sector that went in and cleared this and, and did that to, you know, tons of rivers. So all of that was done because they got roads tucked into the postal clause and because of the general welfare clause. So, yeah. And I mean, in the and, chapter on, and, yeah. And, and, and just to emphasize the, the waterways are, the way that the, the whole idea of connecting the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Lakes 
to Chicago, to the Mississippi, and allows all this internal improvements through the the water transportation system that was also what we've seen in France in the 1600s. China has a large canal that was built, I think, in ancient times. Mm-hmm. And, and, and which is very influential on all Western canal making. And not just the, the engineering, but the fact that it was publicly owned. The British guy who goes out there, and I think it's the 1690s guy named, I think it's Simpson, is his name, and he writes about it, it and he, he, he draws special attention to the fact that this is a publicly owned canal and that that's part of what makes it work, you know? So yeah, not, not just how to do this, but like how, what the ownership structure of this infrastructure should be also c- came to some extent from China. And then it, it, it increases like the power, the productive powers of labor, of capital. When your transportation costs go way down, yeah. Every other cost goes way down. When your energy costs go way down, when when they start really mining coal in yep. Pennsylvania and elsewhere, they're able to start manufacturing and fabricating because they have different transportation hubs that can move the coal down the river and then eventually get the railroad to the, these places. And and it just has this effect that it yeah. lists prosperity. All and I mean, the, the class struggle is, you know, I mean, wor- workers increase their standard of living and increase their wages through the class struggle. But there's limits to to what that can bear if the economy in which that class struggle is happening isn't growing and isn't producing surplus. If it's if you know if labor productivity is rising and there's more and more surplus, and then the question becomes, well, wait a minute, why why are the rich hoarding it all? Let's as the working class get our share of it. You know, then you get what we saw this kind of virtuous cycle of a rising standard of living through through the valor and hard work of workers organizing and struggling against bosses. But we can't forget that like that doesn't work out as well if if the class struggle takes place in an economy that is fundamentally stagnant, not improving productivity, not low growing. technology. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, this happens after Hamilton's death, but it's very much the result of Hamilton's kind of intellectual footprint. The Erie Canal, once it's completed, and it is completed with large federal subsidies, of land and water, not money. Jefferson is Jefferson th- thinks it's a completely crackpot idea, but his Gallatin, his Treasury Secretary, does manage to get some federal resources to New York. Once it's completed, the price of moving a ton of grain drops by ninety five percent, and it thus opens the whole old Northwest, you know, the Ohio Territory. Yeah, and yeah, Ohio River, and, and even before that, the Hudson Valley. So I I do want to like highlight how you compare Jefferson versus Hamilton, and I think even today we're struggling with this. There there still is this idea of the states' rights, the anti-statist, the libertarian side, and but Jefferson's policies led to the underfunding of the most necessary components of national security. And actually leads to the the War of 1812 that the British just are impressing yeah. soldiers until eventually a declaration is, is declared against Britain, War of 1812. But we're, the fortifications are so poor and everything else that Britain comes in and is able to occupy the White House, burn it down, and all these other things. Yeah. That happens under Madison, but it's Jefferson who, I mean, Madison is, is Jefferson's understudy. And Jefferson, with the Revolution of 1800, Jefferson's election... He, he eliminates all internal taxes. And this is always, de- these are always described as regressive taxes because it seems common sense. It's like primarily taxes on consumption, but it wasn't all regressive. There were taxes on houses, taxes on carriages, taxes on slaves. So a lot of these taxes on consumption were on only goods that the elite consume. But normally, you know, 99% of what you read about that is just going to be like mentioning newspapers and, you know, other and alcohol. And so all internal taxes are removed under Jefferson. So that means they only have the revenue from the tariffs at ports. He then, and I mean, let's be clear, we're talking about history. This is not, not to be understood as directions for what we should do now, right? Because I would love to see the U.S. military massively, massively reduced in size. But at that time, it's a different situation. Jefferson basically guts the Navy because there's not enough money to fund it. And that's when the Brits start pushing, pushing, pushing. They're stopping American ships and seizing sailors claiming that they're deserters from the British Army and the British Navy. And then landing 
uh, at American ports and demanding resupply. And, and the War of 1812 happens when there's essentially a riot against a British ship that's landing and demanding resupply. And so Madison goes to war and is totally unprepared. And yes, the British occupy Washington and burn the Capitol and burn the White House. And it's, that was one of my favorite parts of the book to write. I mean, that, that, that story is just so mind blowing. And it's the, the relative of the Coburns. It's the youngest British Admiral ever. What was this? And no, George Coburn, George Coburn, I think. And he's the direct relative of Andrew Coburn, who's the political editor at Counterpunch. Harper's. And Patrick Coburn, who's a very famous foreign correspondent reporting from the Middle East for decades. Laura Flanders is related to them. The, the actress Olivia Wilde is actually Andrew Coburn's daughter. And the late Alexander Coburn, who was a great Marxist journalist and, you know, skating wit. So they're all descended from, from this, this Coburn character. And he is pretty funny. You know, he's like, uh, when they burn Congress, he's in there, he convenes Congress. He's like... Who all, who, who here is in favor of burning this Yankee, this Yankee den of democracy and iniquity? All say aye. And it was like, aye. And they burned the place down. Yeah. And, you know, I, he said, I live just a few miles from Bladensburg, where the Battle of Bladensburg happened, where the British flanked the, the defenses in the Anacostia and the Potomac uh -huh. along the Patoxic and yeah, just marched yeah. down 16th, or yeah. 16th Avenue or whatever. Yeah. So, I mean, Luckily for the United States, as a project, the British were overwhelmed and exhausted and, and didn't want to recolonize the, the place and, you know, didn't need to essentially, but because they could have, because they burnt DC down. So, yeah. Now that said, you know, I am quite, quite harsh with Jefferson and Madison, but they, you know, their concern with civil liberties, even if it was fundamentally rooted in their concern with autonomy and states' rights to protect slavery, is an extremely important part of our politics. And it is one that the left should take very seriously and I think has not, particularly in, in the era of COVID where everyone's just like, okay, whatever, you know, testing for COVID, you know, genetic swab, they just see that like, you know, New York City has now created this essentially perpetual DNA database lineup from all the public worker uh, COVID testing. I mean, these kinds of things are, you know, these are very, very serious concerns. And the working class, regular people are never going to get anywhere if they don't have these civil liberties and if they aren't protected and taken seriously. So there's a bit of a contradiction around civil liberties that I hope people can appreciate and think through, which is that they were championed by working class people, but they also had elite sponsors who were supporting this stuff in many cases for the wrong reasons, which was they were concerned about a strong federal government coming after their slaves. And in the process to, to buy legitimacy with the larger population, they, they support defending freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, you know, a habeas corpus, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah. I, I think that, you know, it would be possible to read my book, and, and I, I think I probably was not. I mean, there are times when I, I make the point that I just made, but I, I think I could probably have, have made it a little clearer that even though I'm critical of these you know, slave powers for supporting this stuff, it doesn't mean that the project of the Bill of Rights was bad. It's, it's quite the opposite. It's, it's extremely important, and it, and it is, in fact, the source of much progress for regular people in this country historically. If you look at, you know, all of the struggles that have delivered, you know, a high standard of living and health to people, these civil liberties have played a very important part. And had, had Hamilton had his way, there would have been none of that. So this yeah. is not, you know, it's not, it's not to be uncritical about any of these characters. So from a lot of Hamilton's writings, he obviously died in the duo with Aaron Burr. But what was born out of that was this American system of political economy. So Henry Clay, John Quincy Adams, it goes to Henry Carey, Lincoln in, implements much of it. We even see these concepts being done in the New Deal under FDR in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And in some of the, the three greatest periods of revolutionary existential crisis in this country has used these concepts of the American system of political economy to 
rebuild our infrastructure and you know labor should come before capital as lincoln said because capital has no value without labor's hands on it so looking today on where we're at in the united states where we have a rapacious elite that is completely out of touch with the american people we have collapsing infrastructure. We have labor unrest everywhere. I feel like we're in an existential period in this country right now, and we may not see the 250 50th anniversary, you know, in, in four years, the way it's going right now. I mean, who knows? That being said, I am still an optimist at heart, and I'm not saying I, I'm not shorting America yet, even though I've been very critical over the last 20 years from the Iraq war and everything else. But how how can we use some of the lessons learned both in the crisis management that is shown in in your book but also using some of these these concepts of manufacturing and and this harmony of interest both with the rural and the urban i think the main thing is to just recognize the importance of planning and to do away with this mythology that that the entrepreneurs do it on their own that there's this huge history of, of hidden government planning and and if we're aware of that, then we can intervene in these debates and try and shape how this inevitable planning happens. I mean, we see this with this semiconductor bill. You know, I mean, I haven't looked into the details, but that's an example of this kind of inevitable planning. It's sort of, you know, political situation changes and the U.S. realizes, you know, due to external reasons that, that it is not sustainable to get 25% of the semiconductor chips from Taiwan. And so you get this massive Unfortunately, it sounds like, you know, just a bunch of corporate welfare, but it's like, you know, Bernie Sanders was against it. But, you know, th these kinds of things happen in the face of crisis. Uh, it's Carl Polanyi said that, you know, laissez-faire is planned and planning is spontaneous. And in his book, The Great Transformation, he tracks how from, from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the, this, you know, early 1700s, mid-1700s, there's a class of elites and entrepreneurs who push back against government regulation and taxes, and they inevitably win. And then they create a crisis for themselves, and usually in the form of some sort of economic depression. And then the government is forced in an unplanned fashion to come in, nationalize things, start, you know, giving people, you know, bread and grain just to keep them alive and keep them from rebelling. And so that's what he means by laissez-faire is planned, i.e. these elites continually push for it. They inevitably win. Their victory creates a, a crisis. And then it's in that crisis that planning kind of comes back spontaneously. So if we can remember that, then we can have better forms of planning. And it can be, you know, less about bailing out banks and less corporate, you know, triage style corporate welfare in the midst of crisis, and we can instead use these moments to redirect our economy in, in the directions that we want to go, which in this case is towards, you know, clean energy and more economic democracy. I mean, you know, there, there have to be, the controls on elites have to increase, the, the controls on the daily lives of working people have to decrease, there has to be higher wages, we have to decommodify more and more of life like housing, healthcare, education, these are the long-term, the near-term, medium-term goals that, that have to be pushed as part of the inevitable planning. So I think that's one of the takeaways, that, that in the face of crises like climate-driven drought, et cetera, there's going to be planning, that it happens, and you'll get this bipartisan stuff. You get, I mean, you saw this most perfectly in the 2008 crash. You've got you know, an entire group of economists who've spent their whole careers criticizing government regulation, criticizing public ownership, praising the market. And then when the, the global financial system begins to melt down, they throw their ideology out the window and they intervene on a massive, massive scale, right? And they basically nationalize the American bank system or, you know, partially nationalize it. You know, they kept the, the worst part. part. <laughs> they kept yeah. the worst part. They, they should have right. liquidated that put it through bankruptcy reorganization and redirected those trillions to actual like investment and, and uh, infrastructure. And, you know, I mean, it was a, on average, every bank had 20% government ownership. And if they hadn't had that, then the other 80% of their value would have, you know, collapsed. 
But they, the government should have been like, yeah, we, we got 20% control, or in some cases it's more, and we're going to vote, you know? And not only are we going to vote, but there's like special emergency measures. It's like, we've got an investment schedule here. Like X amount of this is going to go into infrastructure, X amount into housing, you know, certain percentage into, you know, energy transition. Like this is, this is going to happen. And we're going to be in there, like or our representatives will be on the boards. And we've got this larger plan that, that has to harmonize this whole project. But yeah, instead it was just like, you know. Whatever Citibank wants, on life support. Obama. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Put you on life support. Don't worry, we're not gonna, we're not gonna go after your bonuses. You know, just, just you know, not a single on the road. banker went to jail on like Reagan in 87's crash, or 200 point. or so. Oh man, I, I could go on and on. I really appreciate your time, but I, I know we're, we're out of time, but how can people follow your work? Well, I'm not on social media, but you know, you can Google up my uh, name and you'll see my, my writing. And I mean, this book is, you know, it's out on audible as well as in, in the real, the real form. I've got a, a web page up at John Jay college, which if, if anyone who's listening is interested in political economy, we have a fantastic master's program. That's one of the only places because economics is a very conservative and beyond just the politics of it, it's a very kind of intellectually stale discipline. But there are a couple of places such as UMass, Amherst, um, Salt Lake City, and our little department, John Jay, where we have a much more sort of historically minded, heterodox approach to political economy. So you can find me there at John Jay College as part of the master's program. And uh, yeah. Christian Parenti, thank you so much for your time. And everyone should go out and either listen or buy Radical Hamilton, Economic Lessons from a Misunderstood Founder. Thanks again. Thank you.